Hello and welcome to Canada's History Spring Webinar Series. This series revolves around visual history. Over the next few months, we will hear from educators, public historians, and graphic designers who will speak about their experiences using visual histories to share Canadian history. My name is Jessica Knapp and I am your host for the series. Over the next hour, we will hear from Tom Morton. He will be discussing how to exploit the power of visual sources to create curiosity and teach historical thinking. Before we begin today's presentation, I would like to provide you with a quick introduction to Canada's National History Society. Canada's history is de dedicated to promoting greater popular interest in Canadian history, principally through publishing, education, and recognition programs. If you're interested in knowing more about, more about or subscribing to our flag Ship Publications, Canada's History Magazine, and Kayak, Canada's History Magazine for Kids. I invite you to click on the links on the screen and save them for a later time. I also want to give a reminder that the there is an extended deadline for the Government of Canada History Award for Teachers. The new deadline for teachers only, the students' deadline has passed, is May 8th. So if you're still working on a Government of Canada application, project application, uh, you still have time to submit it. I also want to mention that if you are part of or know of a great community project, activity, or programming that commemorates important aspects of our heritage, uh, I would like you to nominate or apply for the Governor General's History Award for Community Programming. The deadline for that application is June 30th. You can click on the link on the screen for, to bring you to that information page. You're also welcome to email me about any of these topics and I would be happy to discuss them with you. A few reminders for tonight. If you're running any large programs, I recommend you close them down. Although do not close Adobe Connect because then you will be removed from the webinar room and that would be sad. Uh, Closing down these other large programs would, will help you have a better experience. However, if there are issues today, don't worry too much because there will be a recording available for you in the next few days. If you are on social media, I encourage you to spread the word about our conversation tonight. I have included Canada History's Twitter handle and Facebook link on the screen. Uh, as well as the YouTube channel there, so you're welcome to click on those and bookmark them for later. Uh, also, if you have any questions during the webinar, you're welcome to ask them at any time, and Tom will answer them as he sees fit. He may answer them immediately. He may wait until the end for the Q&A session. Both are appropriate. Uh, and if you want to ask a question and you have to leave early, Check back with the recording, and that might be there for you. I want to provide you with a quick introduction to Tom before I hand the mic over to him. Tom Morton is the author of Reading Historical Photographs on the Learning Portal of the Royal BC Museum, and he is co-author with Peter Satius of the Big Six Historical Thinking Concepts. Fabulous book, uh, and the the Keystone Publication for the Historical Thinking Summer Institute, which will be held in Vancouver this summer uh, at the Museum of Vancouver. So if you're interested in attending this or knowing more about this institute, uh, please email me and I'd be happy to tell you more. He has taught for more than 30 years in Sierra Leone, Montreal, and Vancouver before becoming the coordinator for the BC Heritage Fair Society. And Tom, we thank you very, very much for all your hard work with That's a Society. He has received the Social Studies Teachers Association Teacher of the Year Award, the Crown Award for Excellence in Holocaust Education, and the Governor General's History Award for Excellence in Teaching. Now I would like to welcome Tom to begin his presentation. Great. Uh, everybody can hear me, I hope. I'm just waiting for my, uh, I've, I've lost my visual. Uh, there we go. Uh, and uh, welcome to everybody. I'm very excited about doing this, my very first webinar, and a little bit nervous about how to make all the 
B bells and whistles work, but, Je but Jessica, Jessica, Jessica has. I'm going to talk for half an hour, forty minutes or so, and uh, and to leave some enough time for questioning. But uh, if I know myself well, I've uh, probably packed in too much, so I might do a little bit of skipping around. But uh, Jessica will archive this, and uh, and also all the images that you're going to see are hyperlinked to. Um, um, to, to the source or to some background information. And if you do want to learn a little bit more, there's also up here uh, on, you can see uh, some uh, websites for the Historical Thinking Project if you want to follow up uh, on, the, um, on what historical thinking means and also on BC Heritage Fairs, though uh, unfortunately we've had some troubles with hijacking, so uh, please don't go on this site uh, with uh, with uh, Firefox, uh, go on it with Safari or some other web browser. So what I want to do work with you today is um, my intentions is that you'll leave here with a better understanding, as the de description says, of the potential of using visual primary source, mainly with photographs, but also for some of the challenges. And because I'm going to assume that you're mostly teachers, I want to talk a bit about uh, different approaches to teaching historical thinking using primary sources. For example, questioning, of course, uh, this is in the description. Um, then the thinking aloud strategy, which was so instrumental in, um, in as a research tool by Sam Weinberg, who uh, looking at how um, historians and high school students um, talking aloud about what they thought about uh, uh, primary sources was so instrumental in establishing um, the, the research around historical thinking, but also as a good instructional tool. And then if I have time, I also want to talk about uh, developing uh, chronological fluency using timelines. But I'm going to begin with a homage, homage to Charlie Howe, uh, who I see is on the website, I'm happy to say. Charlie is uh, celebrated for these books, among many other resources that he's written, which are a great uh, visual uh, source of um, visual primary sources. I'm not going to talk about um, uh, Canadian about uh, political cartoons. I'm going to mainly focus on uh, one painting and on photographs. But uh, this is hyperlinked to where you can order these books, an essential resource, I would say. But I want to talk about uh, my homage to homage to Charlie is a, because he is the first person who gave me uh, this image that I used for going in depth with historical thinking. Um, this uh, celebrated painting that you probably know well and may have used yourself, but um, and Charlie also, as he tends to do, did all the research for me on this one, so he gave me the background. Um, I have the, got this hyperlinked to uh, um, also almost as good resource uh, uh, background for this by uh, historian Simon Shama uh, in a New York Times article. So when this is when Jessica archives this, you can go and take a look at that. So I want to model for this. Um, first of all, I want to set up the inquiry. How I use this uh, when I was teaching great, uh, with grade ten students. Uh, at the time, as a, and, and then I want to also model it for thinking out loud. So uh, even before West's Death of Wolf was exhibited at the Royal Academy, it was famous uh, by rumor, and the public had formed lines uh, down the street for admission. Lord Grosvenor had already paid uh, 400 guineas to buy the painting, uh, and the nobility were the first to go and view it at the Royal Academy. The King, George III, arrived to view the painting, but he'd let it be known that he was critical of it, and he had no intention of buying it like Lord Grosvenor did. But the public found it to be a stunning tour de force, and they convinced the King to change his mind, and he commissioned a copy from Wolf. The death of Wolf went on to become reproduced on porcelain jugs, cups, teapots, prints, even a pantomime. It became the embodiment of British patriotism, and West was officially designated the court history painter by the king. So when British children of future generations grow up, 
This was how they saw the death of Wolf and the Battle of Quebec, despite it being painted 10 years after the event and full of historical inaccuracies. In other words, much like Star Wars today, the death of Wolf was a blockbuster. So that would be my inquiry question for students. Why? What did this painting, what did the, this highlights the author's purpose in his message. In other words, what is, might be called sourcing. What was it about this painting that, uh, that, uh, that captured the, the imagination of so many of, uh, of the English, uh, English men and women of this time? So now I'd like to model a little bit of thinking out loud what one would do with that. Uh, I would certainly want to begin, let's see if I got my pointer. Ah, uh, well, there we go. So I certainly would want to begin in the center because this is quite clearly Wolf, Death of Wolf. Here's the only dead person that I can see. Uh, the light is shining on him. He's surrounded all the attention by a number of his officers and also quite curiously, by this uh, that I know to be Mohawk or uh, looking at him. I'd also want, so I spend some time around that, pointing out the flag, using some context by knowledge. Oh, I've lost, lost this here. I have lost Adobe Connect. I hope you can hear me. There we go. Sorry, I, I, I think I, it's already as high. I have to be careful with this because uh, I didn't realize that the picture itself would be hyperlinked. So I have to be careful using the, uh, the pointer. Um, so I'd also want to take a look. I'm going to click off the pointer from there. I want to take a look at the, uh, at the over on the margins, on the margin of the right hand side. And I can see the, the um, uh, I'd want to draw the student's attention in thinking aloud to this, uh, the, the ships coming in and the uh, English climbing the battle. And they seem to be walk going towards the battle, but the battle seems from judging, making inference from the over on the left hand side, the, uh, the light and the flashing there that the, uh, um, that the battle is already taking place. And I know that Wolf died uh, on the, See if I can move that pointer. I know that Wolf died after the battle use, using my context. So there's some elements here that I want to draw their attention to. So uh, once I spent some time with that modeling close observation, I want to move on to talk about answering the inquiry question. What made this such a blockbuster? Well, let me give you the opening sentence from Simon Sharma. It was the light that did the trick a clean, shrewdly directed radiance illuminating the face of the martyr and bathing the grieving expressions of his brother officers in a reflection of impossible holiness. Now, Shama goes on in much greater depth, but I want to mention here two other key features that I think you would want to look at if you're trying to get inside this painting, get inside the head of the, of the, the, the English men and women of the time. Uh, I'd want to point to this, another reading of this that one could do, which would be the narrative reading that we have a story going on here. The soldiers coming to also Foulon, climbing up the, the, the uh, cliff, getting past the French sentries, sentries, going off to line up to battle the French, defeating the French, coming over here, the news of the victory coming to Wolf. So another appealing thing, element of this that makes it a blockbuster is not just the, it, it, it's, it's not just the light coming through on, on Wolf, that trick that Shama talked about, that painterly trick, but also the story that it tells. And I'd also want to do with my students that I also had some time when I did this with my grade 10 students, I knew that they had some prior experience, some of them that were Christian at least, of seeing religious paintings. And this is very similar to the religious paintings of Christ coming down from the cross. All of these elements combine together and Shama gives very much more, help explain why this painting in reflecting the values of great sacrifice towards the British empire was very appealing to the British audience 
and made it very popular here. Uh, further questions? What's the Mohawk doing here? What is the Mohawk Hadanasi doing? When Wolf actually detested the Mohawk, he had nothing, wanted nothing to do with them. They were, they were depraved, they were cruel savages. And they also, they fought on the other side, they fought for the French. So thank you very much, Charlie Howe. That was a, I enjoyed doing this lesson. I did it many times when I was teaching grade 10. So let me move on to talk a little bit about why you would use primary sources. Above all, it seems to appeal to students. It warms them up. It doesn't have the barriers that text sometimes has. And uh, it can often, these can often be very engaging. Now we know that, the, that, that uh, photographs can have an emotional impact uh, from the image, famous image of Alain Kurdi, the two-year-old Syrian boy whose body washed up on a beach in southern Turkey last September. This thrust the civil war of Syria from the back pages to the front pages of the world's newspapers. It was an important factor in the election of the Trudeau government and the settlement of 25,000 Syrian refugees. Uh, I think also another important reason is what Sam Weinberg refers to in this quotation here, that uh, students, uh, there are so many Im images around uh, us and uh, it, uh, we're up to our necks in them and they tell us what to do and how to, how, what to believe. And this can give, give us some kind of help to, um, uh, it, by doing this, it has some links to media literacy and citizenship education. But there are challenges to, um, to using visual primary sources. For one thing, uh, students are not predisposed to uh, spending time interrogating images. Um, access is not synonymous with learning. Uh, Jennifer Roberts is the uh, um, art historian at Harvard. And for her, one of her uh, first uh, assignments she does is to ask her students to go to the Boston Art Gallery and find a painting that particularly attracts them and then to sit in front of it for uh, three hours. Now what she wants to do is to have students slow down and learn to savor images, to look at them closely, uh, to find some meaning with sensitivity and nuance. Now uh, three hours of uh, slowing down ain't gonna cut it for Canadian students, but I think we can ask them for two or three minutes, um, especially if you have a worksheet that helps them make some notes. But it's definitely uh, a barrier that we need to, a challenge that we need to address. Uh, the other is that uh, students uh, are not predisposed to looking uh, at uh, images in a critical eye that uh, they think often, especially photographs, are a clear window into the past, and they see them as inherently truthful, and they are not. They are often sophisticated constructions designed to communicate messages, and they should not be taken at face value. Uh, I want to just quickly show uh, a little bit of research from Stéphane Levesque uh, and his team uh, that they did. This is... Uh, he used eye tracking uh, software uh, apparatus and thinking aloud to study how students and historians read photographs during a web uh, during a web quest. The photograph is from uh, the exhibit where the children on residential schools and the students are doing uh, handwriting practice. Uh, and the eye tracking reveals what the participants. In this case, somebody that Stefan classified as a low history literacy reader, what they looked at for how long and in what order. This is a color version. And red is where they spent the most time and uh, yellow less, green less. And the next slide is a colored version of a high historical literacy reader. So you can see in this case how much more time, uh, I think it's visual, 
it's pretty clear that it's how much more time that this particular participant looked at the image and also looked at the source, looked at who did it, where it came from, to try to make meaning and uh, interpret and interrogate this particular visual image. Okay, I want to get into this uh, in a little bit more, into some teaching approaches using some of the ideas that are on the learning portal of the RBCM, Royal BC Museum. And uh, I'm just going to go through a few pointers. You can take a look at that if you wish. Uh, but I want to start with a little uh, exercise. So I hope that you have a keyboard close at hand to take part. And if you don't, or if you don't want to take part, please make this uh, a thought experiment and take part in your head. So when you think of the gold rush, and all this was based around an exhibit, uh, the next uh, number of slides around it was based around an exhibit on the BC gold rush that was, was at the RBCM recently. Uh, and so I want you to think, when you think of the BC gold rush, what comes to mind? What images? Could you please type out a few words uh, about uh, the people you imagine, what they're doing? And I'll pause here. These are great. And let's take a couple more. Okay. okay. All right, I'm going to go on. Uh, so please keep on typing, but I'm going to carry on just because there's I have limited time here. And uh, these are quite similar to when I've done this with student teachers, class of student teachers, quite similar. So do your images look like this? They seem to be white men, long beards, gold panning. Or do they look like this? They don't seem to look too much like this. La Compromix or Stolo gold miners? Women. Women here too in a theater production from Barkerville. Or Chinese. There was a great number of Chinese, especially at Quinell Flats, just to the south of Barkerville. So the one thing that visuals can do is to give us a very a diversity of the past, show us the diversity of the past beyond the mainstream narrative in very quick uh, and a quick uh, way to do that. So these are some, so my basic inquiry is what gold rush stories are worth telling and how can photographs help us tell them? So a few suggestions for planning, decide on what concept you want to teach. And I'm going to uh, focus on the time that I have. Uh, I'm going to focus on evidence and then to choose an image with care, engaging, relevant and high resolution. And then research the image. That's where that, some, you know, that allows you to form some really good questions. And that uh, sometimes that will be a challenge because it's not always uh, given to you on a platter by Charlie Howe. Elements of evidence that you want, I'm going to just go through these briefly. We can look back at these. Inferencing, asking good questions, getting students to ask them. And then I'll probably go through some of these, judging as the time goes on. Uh, I'm going to look at these fairly quickly, some of these lat latter three here. Uh, I would include probably close observation as one of them. But let's move on to an image that I did choose or inferencing, 
And what I want to do is close observation here, maybe starting at the top here. The, the, there am I? I'm trying to get my pointer, but I think you can see the first half of looking very closely, having students spend those one, two, three minutes. Uh, there we go. I've got my pointer working. A little. Sorry about that. There we go. So spending some time here in the first half and then in the second half. Now, in this particular case, I didn't give a caption. I didn't give the provenance of the source because I might want to, with younger students, try to get them to understand what the heck is this structure here? What is it? Now, many of you may know this, but uh, students may not know it. Suggestions for teaching. Spend time to observe closely. Connect to context, but maybe, as I explained, you might want not to give some of the context to, so you can encourage curiosity. You might only want to give them a little bit of context, but they'll need to know. Knowledge is really important. This they can't not do good uh, in-depth inferences unless they have some uh, um, uh, good context to do that. Uh, and then the other things, uh, looking at the sourcing looking and getting students to pose some questions. Okay, so here's the context, or at least the caption to give you a little bit more context. Uh, um, focusing particularly on Patello, because he is named in the picture. And here are some questions that you might ask. What did you see? Now, not this is a, uh, a question that everybody can answer. All your students can answer. Whoops, where am I? I'm losing myself here. A little, where are we? Okay, there we go. What do you see? And I saw it. So, uh, this is something that all your students can say. I wouldn't ask them, what are they doing? Because the students might not have any clue, but they certainly can answer that question of, what can they see? Um, if they don't see something, we might uh, we want them to uh, draw that to their attention. Uh, for example, you might say, "What is what is uh, Patello standing on here?" Uh, so you might want to draw their attention to that particular element. Um, some questions too you could ask, some inferencing questions, moving from very simple to somewhat more advanced with some context. What will the flume be used for? What else might happen uh, as a result of using that flume? Uh, again, knowledge of the context increases the chance that students can make some sense of this. this. Uh, let me show you, I hope this comes on. Jessica, I don't see this on the, the screen here. This is a, a little video that's supposed to be showing up. Let's see if it shows up. Jessica? My apologies, Tom. I wasn't aware there was a video in your PowerPoint. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to play it for you today. Um, oh, that is unfortunate. Let me see if I can share my, I'll try loading it up on my computer and see if I can share my screen with everybody. Just okay. uh, hold tight and I'll test it out. Two minutes tops. We'll know if we can do it. Well. Okay, you let me know. I'm gonna let me go on. Uh, I, I probably don't want to take two minutes of time here, but uh, uh, if you find it, bring it in because it's got a nice soundtrack to it, and I think it's worth doing. But other than that, you're gonna have to look it up on the on the RBCM uh, website. Uh, let me talk a little bit about generating student questions. Now you know what IQ is, but uh, probably not so many of you know what CQ is. CQ means curiosity quotient, and it's a term coined by American journalist Thomas Friedman as part of a formula to explain how individuals can be powerfully motivated to learn about a personally interesting subject, whether they not they have a high IQ or not. It's fictitious. There's no research to be behind this formula, but it's fun. CQ, curiosity quotient, plus PQ, passion quotient, quotient is greater 
than, I, than IQ. So how to get students to, uh, to generate some questions, to really reflect their curiosity, especially if they're uh, adolescents, a uh, little, uh, little bit timid. Uh, well, here's one way from, or not just one way, four guideline steps from uh, Rothstein and Santana from their book, Make, Make Just One Change. What they call QFT, question formation technique, uh, we might call brainstorming. And I think you all know brainstorming, but I generally find that uh, it's uh, not you so much. Uh, it's uh, because what we do is we often stop to discuss, to judge or answer the questions. But with time, as certainly Rothstein and Santana suggest we can do, we can get students to be much more forthcoming uh, in, in developing questions. Uh, I short circuit some of this by giving question prompts. It's, it certainly helps guide them to some extent. So these are the kinds of things that I would do kind of prompts that I would do, certainly, especially why and how questions. Other ways to support the students, I talked about brainstorming and prompts. Other ways would be to look at exemplars, such as on our website. Knowledge and diverse sources can certainly help students generate good inquiry questions. Having criteria established behind and beforehand. And if you're doing any kind of a project, you want to plan for both peer and teacher feedback and some revision. And certainly, you want to have a key inquiry question if they're going to do any long-term project. Um, others is to honor the student choice, the student uh, creation of a question, uh, making, a, making student questions as a start point for the next lesson, including them on a test, that kind of modeling. Uh, I see that Jessica has uh, found the link to the uh, to the uh, um, to the video that, that I think is gives you some good example of uh, how you might uh, develop in-depth inferencing. Do we want to try uh, the video inquiry? too? Uh, no, let's let's wait and see. Maybe we can do it at the end. Okay, perfect. There's there's a thing to that, that that's uh, that's the. Uh, the draw at the end of the evening so that keep people to stick around till the end. They can see this charming video from, <laughs> I hope charming. And there are some criteria for good questions. Uh, they need to be doable. Not too hard that students get frustrated and turned off, but not too easy that they just lose interest. This is too easy. So you want those uh, Goldilocks tasks to do. Um, purposeful, that they point to some kind of uh, disciplinary learning, engaging, and if possible, make those questions connected to the lives of students, especially if they're your questions, linked to the lives of students or some present day issues. Okay, uh, what next? Um, let's see. Ah, once they pose the answer to the questions, they want to work on some corroboration, and that's where you can bring in some of these various uh, different uh, resources and ask them, do they support their hypothesis? They challenge it? Is that the storyline that they've created? Or does it somehow expand their storyline if, if that uh, the idea of what stories are important to tell is your inquiry question? Um, let's see, We've got sourcing. I think I might just go through this quickly as I seem to be running out of time. This is the key element uh, that uh, the term was co co coined by Sam Weinberg. Uh, these are some kind of questions you might ask. Uh, trying to look at the, the sourcing means uh, looking at the, uh, the values behind the, uh, the photographer and, and what this tells us about the audience at the time, uh, why the picture was taken. And above all, what leads you to think so? Go, going back to the photograph and also going back to the uh, to what they know about the context. Uh, and you also might want to focus in closely on um, on T. R. Patello in the center there. Uh, here's some heritage fair uh, 
this might be a little bit hard to read, but uh, some, some of their projects, some student projects. This uh, he, this student, uh, she is a grade six, seven student, and she's got the stereotypes of of native people uh, that were prominent of the time. And then uh, here, so that's where she has her stereotypes. And he, over here, she talks about the photograph of a, a naked First Nations. Uh, man, and this was reflecting this this idea that the stereotype that they were in tune with nature. So this is very much an example of trying to see what the values and the worldview of the photographer was, and what we can learn by sourcing the photograph. This is the general store of change. What can primary sources tell us about how stores in BC changed from the 1850s? to the uh, 2000s, and she uses advertisements and, uh, and photographs to tell that general store of change. Okay, uh, I'm running short of time, so let me just go through a couple of things here. Uh, we've got uh, looking at the historical significance, and this is the idea of a narrative reading that's so important to establishing significance, a narrow uh, narrative reading of a, of a photograph. And it lends itself to images such as this one, which is the um, uh, one of the perhaps the most world famous Canadian image uh, uh, done from World War II uh, that was used in in all over the place. Uh, and so this certainly can be given a narrative uh, reading. And considering the question, why did it become so famous? This is a photograph from the city of New Westminster that recently had a monument uh, commemorating the photograph. And there's a website that you can uh, look at if you want to get the background to this particular photograph. Um, I think it's included in a, a book from Canada's National History on our most famous photographs. This one I never did do with students. Um, I never had a chance to. I've just seen it recently. I fell in love with it, or at least I was very captivated by it when I saw it at the uh, Asian Studies Center at UBC. If I was going to use it, I would want students uh, to first look at the uh, the background, the, uh, read the, look at it carefully for the tar paper shack, the mountain location. I w to keep their curiosity to tell that story, imagine that story, I would not give them the caption. But I think most of you can, uh, can understand or can probably uh, infer what this picture is. And especially when contrasted with a picture of the Tashmi uh, um, internment camp uh, in the winter can help tell that story. Continuity and change, the classic uh, there, uh, stereotype, bad rap about, uh, about, the, um, uh, about uh, history, you know, that idea that I wasn't good in history class because I couldn't memorize dates. It's, uh, it's a false cliche, but uh, getting somehow things in the sequence of events in the order is really important to do. Uh, and timelines are the key way of teaching chronology. Uh, the timeline, however, has generally been an, an underachiever. Lists of events in chronological order are pretty common in textbook, but they don't realize the potential of what they could have. But read what uh, researchers uh, Linda Levstick and Keith Barton say when they looked at one particular American teacher's classroom. And the key here is that the timeline that the teacher had put up was a visual one and also one had the diversity of the past. It, used, it talked about social history, clothes, phones, cars, objects, that kind of thing that made it so useful for the students. Here's a one that's a little hard to read. I, I, it's from a, this, this teacher, a Heritage Fair teacher, had the students, uh, they uh, made 3D representations of their uh, Heritage Fair projects, and then she strung them up in a timeline across the ceiling of her classroom. You can see, if you look, 
a little, I'm trying to get the pointer to work for me. Oh, well, there, let's see, we got her to work. There we go. You can see the dates. You can see the uh, some of the 3D objects. This is a map of China. This is the date when the first Chinese immigrants came. We've got the invention of basketball. These are grade six and seven students, after all. This is the Stanley Cup here. I think this is something to do with World War I. This is the Halifax explosion. Uh, so it's a mixture of a whole bunch of different things uh, in this. But there it is for all the students to see and, for, and to look at uh, as she goes along. Uh, here's a couple of other individual projects. This is the, the biography. Uh, top left is a biography of a, um, of a, of a street, Kingsway in Vancouver. And the uh, bottom right is, the, uh, is a timeline of using photographs of residential schools, the history of residential schools. Uh, whoops, I'll skip ahead a little bit. This is from uh, Lindsay Gibson. Uh, if you want to take a look at this using uh, for the history of Chinese in British Columbia, had developed this game uh, that would, could be done in small groups. And if you, when this is archived, I won't take the time, but I certainly enjoy doing uh, human timelines with using the students' bodies. And this gives the uh, gives an explanation of how one may go about doing this. Uh, you'll also find online. Um, some comments on historical perspective taking. And I think, though, I better uh, stop here because I've only, I'm running down to just about 15 minutes left. So I'm going to open this up to questions. Uh, I do, oh, I do want to just move ahead and just make a few last few comments here that much of this, as I've said, depends upon knowledge. and reflection as we go. I haven't emphasized that enough. And none of this comes easy. Experts do these things, such as sourcing, contextualizing, but only because their mental toolbox enables them to do so. The only path to expertise, as far as anyone knows, involves long, focused practice. So let me open this up to your questions and we'll see if I can respond to them, please. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you for um, catering your presentation to the time that we have here today. I see many people are writing in their questions and I'm going to start the question and answer period off with asking you in what ways have you had success teaching visual history that are worth sharing? Uh, for example, good resources or approaches that have worked. Uh, okay, well, th yeah, that was my question. Uh, I, I hope I referred to that throughout the presentation. I was hoping that uh, people could chime in with some of those things. Um, uh, I would, and if it were me to go, I would certainly uh, want to look at uh, uh, Charlie Howe's uh, website uh, and all the in incredible resources that he has on this. Um, if I were also looking for resources, I'd want to go to the Critical Thinking, the T Critical Thinking Consortium, which has got these collections of, uh, of um, resources, some of which are, are free, but some of which you need to join uh, and have a membership. But there's just a great collection of, of photographs on a lot of the common themes in Canadian history. So uh, those come to mind immediately. Uh, I hope you all subscribe to Canada's History Magazine and visit their website frequently. Uh, there's certainly lots of different things. Um, and uh, I think if you take a look at some of the hyperlinks that I did in my slideshow, it'll also give you some ideas. Uh, so apart from that, I'll let uh, the participants chime in as they go. But, uh, uh, oh, I see somebody's chiming. I work in the museum. Uh, and so certainly museum websites um, are, are, have got lots of great resources. So uh, please do that. How long did it take? I'll just start. John Myers has come in. 
I would spend working uh, with the Death of Wolf picture, for example, I could get up to 45 minutes with students. Uh, I'd have them come up in pairs to point as it would be projected on the screen. I did it as a whole class projection with an LCD projector. And they would point out things. They would go back. They, I'd give them, I have a, uh, you know, a, they'd record them and write them down. They'd talk about it in pairs, that kind of thing. Um, but if you're doing it for the first time, you know, it might just be, I mean, it doesn't have to be that long. It could be as little as five minutes. Yeah, archives. Oh, um, the early one uh, with uh, Kutera, I guess Simone, I forget her name. She did a website for with link to the Ontario archives. It was just l full of just wonderful images, the, the archives of Ontario. Yes, I certainly really enjoy that site and, um, and the archives of British Columbia, of course. So, yes, yeah, thank you for forgetting her name, Sum Sumantha Kutera. Another new resource that um, I will take the time to recommend because it just became available to the public is the database through the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, accessing it through the geographical locations of residential schools in Canada uh, allows you to geographically focus um, the images that you're using and uh, many of the resources are resources is the wrong word, excuse me, many uh, additional materials with the history of the residential schools are images as well as um, written documentation. And thus far, I think it's been not too publicized. So if that's a way for you to start um, processing the history of residential schools in the classroom, I would recommend that. I can share the link momentarily. Great. Um, yeah, they're introducing the question of, uh, of doctored fo photos. Um, uh, we want to understand that there could be something very, you know, we want to understand that all photographs are constructions. They all reflect the, uh, the, the viewpoint of the photographer. And so uh, that, if you like, they're all biased. And we want to try to look at that bias of this and, uh, and then admit that it might lead itself some, um, for example, of this, um, some of these photographs of the Crimean War, and I forget, uh, maybe John Myers could add to us, uh, I forget the title of the, uh, and the author of the, um, of the book, the, who, who spent an immense amount of time going back and looking at the uh, Crimean War photographs and uh, trying to decide if they were biased or not. Um, and, uh, and, 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 Admitting some that this does take place, uh, and that the uh, but nonetheless the photograph, whether biased, whether falsified or not, it reflects some kind of viewpoint of the photographer. Uh, yeah, Flickr images and some, some several libraries now uh, have some great uh, Flickr images in the public domain. Oh my goodness, there's lots of uh, there's lots of uh, resources that people are coming up with that we can go and look back at that. Uh, some other questions uh, for be, when they're in the public domain. I always like to check, see if I'm going to actually use them, certainly if I want to use them in a presentation. Uh, an awful lot of them are in, uh, uh, are, you know, they do indicate on the site that they're uh, in, the, uh, in, in wiki commons. Um, uh, uh, they do show. Let's take a look. Ah yes, uh, examining the evidence. That was where that was. I was gonna. I have a. I love examining the evidence. It's a really good book, and uh, I'd especially like what they what they do. Uh, Beverly's suggestion there. Um, uh, there, they use an example that I was going to give, uh, but I I skipped over it. Is uh, using a image of uh, Babe Ruth, uh, although they don't say it's Babe Ruth. It's a, a Baltimore boy. Uh, uh, at the age of three or four, and they give some really good example of how you can use that to um, for to to develop the idea that students uh, shape an image that they tend to bring their own contemporary values and their own uh, 
um, ideas to it. So I really like that examining the evidence book. Let's see whatever questions we've got. Thanks, everyone, for sharing your resources. Uh, Tom, maybe we can talk about some of the challenges you have faced, as well as everybody, if anybody else wants to share some of the challenges they've had to deal with, um, and maybe ask Tom how to deal with some of those. OK, well, I think I outlined some of those challenges. One of is is to really cultivate the questions uh, is to um, is, is, is doing the research around those kinds of things. Um, the other is that, that students, it takes an awful lot of time. I mean, I, sh I sh was just showing, me, I showed a couple of images of where students, I think, did a very good job of inferencing sourcing, but they don't necessarily, they, uh, they, they I, there was a, uh, one, I have a photograph of it, uh, of, of students who, a student who has these, they're, there's the print, there, there, it, it's a march in the 1930s, and they've got a, 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 a they're, they're focused on the print, and uh, they, they, the assumption is that they, they're looking at a riot, but they see uh, marchers that are very well dressed, marching very orderly, there's absolutely no in, evidence of there, there being a riot, but in the, uh, in this uh, uh, sign that they're, they're, they're holding, uh, refers to first to a riot, so the student is assuming that it's a riot. So it just it takes a. It's, I guess they've still got up that slide of persistence there. It takes a considerable amount of time, so that students sometimes uh, ignore the evidence that they've already accumulated, ignore their research, and just jump to what they think is the conclusion they want to put down. So it's just it takes a lot of bit of time uh, of, of and try to. Uh, observe closely, uh, trying to get some, uh, uh, have students observe them, get them to write down, and just taking some time with this. So let me take a look at some other questions that are down there. Uh, images that have no context or information on, are they still useful in engaging students in perceiving what is happening without knowing the answers? Says Evelyn, I, th I think they are. Uh, it, that is the challenge. We don't necessarily have that kind of context. Um, but it might limit you in terms of where you want to go with it. Uh, great. I don't know very much. I do just don't know very much about the Iwo Jima flag, though. Uh, and so uh, that might be one to look into. Uh, any other questions? Still got Craig taking, so uh, according to this, so. Now we've got a multiple of <laughs> Oh, yeah, their own family's historical photographs. No, I think uh, it, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. I have them. I would. I think it's a good thing for both elementary and for and for secondary students is to bring in some uh, artifact or photograph that tells some kind of a story. I've, I've done it where uh, I've had the others in a, do it in a small group where others would, before they talked about the, this and explained it, where the others would try to make infer their own inferences knowing the student. Uh, you have to watch it that their inferences are, are kind inferences. You have to frame it. But I think that's a particular way in how, and it also underlines the importance of context. But yeah, no, I think that's a great way and the value to talk about and then also to talk about what the photograph doesn't tell as well. I think that's an, just as important a question, what, it, what, what you don't learn from that photograph. So thank you, Craig, for that. Oh, I like Marius's comment. <laughs> We will take one more, one last yes, question from Evelyn, and uh, then we will start okay. to wrap up. Well, can you uh, can you do the uh, click us to uh, able to do the um, uh, the gold rush inferencing uh, uh, video? Let's give it a shot. Okay, but let's see if there. Okay, why don't you do that? 
I don't have a draw for the Maytag washer or uh, or the iPad. So in place of that, I've got this. Oh, here we go. I thought. Okay, it's in your hands, Jessica. <laughs> Well, it wouldn't be. Well, you, you, you can't do something with a beginner in technologies like me uh, without some uh, tech, technical glitches. So thanks anyway, Jessica. Uh, thanks, I'm sorry. I missed the, your last comment there. Last comment was, I'll let you wrap up. Oh, okay, wonderful. Um, so thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Thank you again, Tom, for your presentation and entertaining the questions today. Um, were you able to see the video? Or did you really just hear the music? Anyways, that link is available and I will create a document with all the resources that were listed in the chat box today um, as a, an additional link with the webinar in the recording. So if you have joined us tonight, please look for that when I send out an email about the recording being available. I am going to send a link around right now about the survey for the webinar. So if you enjoyed it or if you hated it or if it was only mediocre, um, we do want to know. I thoroughly enjoyed myself uh, and I learned something new from these webinars every time. And I hope everyone else does too. A little note about next week, or not next week, but in a little less than two weeks, uh, we will have a presentation from the Graphic History Collective, and they will discuss graphic histories and the use of comics, or the uses, plural, of comics in education. So if you haven't already registered for that, please do. And with that, I would like to wish everyone a good night or good afternoon, depending on where you are in Canada. And one more thank you for joining us tonight. Cheers. <laughs>